Uh, I want to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, we have Nicolette Cajal. I'm sorry, am I, am I pronouncing your, your last name correctly? Cajal? <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, she is a faculty member at Duke University's uh, Nic Nicholas School for the Environment. And her uh, uh, presentation tonight is uh, on snakes. And we're really excited to have her um, come and share with us her experience and, and just participate with our group. Um, Nikki, I see your, your name is shortened to Nikki. I hope you don't mind um, if I use that. Um, the New Mexico Herpological Society is sort of a small group, but we have a long history uh, here in New Mexico. We're in fact celebrating our 60th year as a group, making us one of the oldest local herpetological organizations in the country, if not the world. And so we have this really great uh, community here uh, based in New Mexico and um, sort of focused in the Albuquerque area. And we're just happy that you took some time with us and we really appreciate uh, just the effort in coming here. We know it's not always just like an easy thing to do. Um, and so we really do uh, truly appreciate you coming here and I'm really excited to hear about the presentation. So um, I'll give you a, a minute to you can share your screen and, and introduce yourself uh, in a more complete way than I was able to and, and uh, the, the Zoom is yours. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let's get that going. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Thank you. Great. Yeah, the presentation is up and looks wonderful. So far. Well, Max, thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be speaking with you all. Um, today, I get to share with you a passion that I suspect many of us have in common, which is snakes, um, snake conservation. So I am a faculty member and ecologist at Duke University. I've studied snakes formally for over 20 years. I've been a passionate advocate for snakes for as long as I can remember. I've traveled around the world. I, I think that some of the experiences that I'll be sharing today, I imagine, um, you all have had some of these same experiences too. So it's really, it'll be nice to share. Maybe we can share some experiences. I've been to Australia, Peru, Cuba, and beyond trying to understand snakes better and understand people better too. I've done research much closer to my home. I'm originally from Illinois. So I've done research in the prairies of Illinois and also the Piedmont forests of North Carolina. So I have my own history with snakes, and so do you. Everyone's story is a little bit different. And I think what I'd like to do is attend first to your story. So I have some images that I'm going to go through that we can use as prompts. And then in the chat box, feel free to respond to my prompts in the chat. So... First thing I wanna do, just ask you, what do you see? When you see this image, what is the story going through your mind? What does it remind you of and how do you feel? I can go ahead and add to the chat. All right, humored. I think it's a king snake. Yeah, I got some identification there. You know, for a, a lot of us that are working on that identification, I'm trying to figure out like why the guy is so freaked out about a king snake, but that's okay. <laughs> yes, stupid Hollywood. Right. Yeah, well, I see this image. Like, I think maybe some frustration like I feel a little frustrate frustrated right poor little snake being frightened like that exactly all right let's try another image see how how you respond to this one when you see this it's going through your head Yeah, it's like anatomically problematic snake depiction. 
Yeah, the original story of why snakes get a bad rap. Fairy tale, the doom snake, toxic fairy tales. Looks like a like this lizard, right? Yeah, it makes me wonder if there's a snake at all there. Thing looks like it can blink to me. But again, poor little snake being taken advantage of like that, right? All right, how about this? What's going through your mind here? Lovely. Uh, artisan. Hmm. River spirit, honored in art. We're looking at art, you know, from a different culture. And the words that are popping up for us, right? With a different culture from the first scene to this scene, they're different. Yeah, this makes you a part of someone's culture and experience, important in some way. And how about this? Poop snake. I'm wondering if that's related to fertility or blessing. A lot of attention to detail. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for doing that with me. Yeah, it is. It is a little wine tasting dish there from from around Burgundy in France. So what I want to say is that you know some of us have been inundated with negative images of snakes, and some have been living our lives with more positive associations. Some folks in the world have had negative experiences with snakes and others have had more positive experiences with snakes. And our history with snakes impacts who we are and also conservation efforts. And that's why I wrote Saving Snakes. For years, I've been grappling with these parallel concerns. The first is that people seem less and less connected to the natural world, to plants, animals, landscapes, and also that natural world's disappearing, whole ecosystems are being destroyed, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And I think one piece of the solution is to cultivate empathetic connection to the natural world. But then I'm also concerned for, I have this deep connection to, and a sheer fascination with this group of animals that you know really make some people's skin crawl, snakes. I love the way they move, I love their vulnerability, their ecology. I think they're amazing. And, and despite how incredibly cool they are, like for me, right, these are creatures that can essentially like unhinge their jaws. They essentially have two penises instead of one. They're really cool. Despite this, most people don't want to see them and they certainly don't want to protect them. And that's a problem because snakes are not only fascinating, but they're critical. They're critical to ecosystem function. They connect the food web. And so I think this is where we can start our journey. The first point that I want to make is that snakes are fascinating, but we still know relatively little about them. When I was growing up uh, as a child in Northern Illinois, I su suspect that others in the room might have similar stories to mine here. I'd often head out into the woods or a little tract of what we call prairie is really an old field. And a clear memory for me is walking through this old field with my dad and lifting up half rotten plywood and looking beneath. And there was just this tremendous sense of adventure, excitement, what's gonna be underneath there. We lift up one board and look beneath it, nothing. Lift up another, nothing. And then you'd lift up a board 
and you'd find it. A beautiful snake like this one, decked out in black and yellow stripes, the garter snake. And for me, that moment of curiosity and adventure leads to another and another. Is there going to be a snake under the next board? What do the snakes do under there? Why are they there? Is this where they sleep? Do snakes sleep? Is this where they eat, what do they eat, how many snakes are there. So in this, curiosity is a starting place. And curiosity then serves as this key to future conservation, to compassion, and I think maybe to civil civilization as well. So effective conservation requires us to expand our worldview. And when I was 13, I began to volunteer here at the Grove, a nature center in Northern Illinois. And I would clean tanks and feed salamanders and talk to visitors. And it was really, it was a wonderful place to volunteer. In high school, I even got a proper job. My very first job was as a naturalist. And during my downtime, I'd often sit in front of this large glass tank filled full of water snakes. And the water snake tank stretched from floor to ce ceiling. The bottom half was essentially a fish tank and include minnows and the water snakes hunt for the minnows in there. And the top half was a platform that was propped up with a tangle of branches and then the water snakes would sit on the branches and bask. And if you don't mind, I think I'd like to read just a little excerpt from my book to explain this better. I'm just giving you a sense of me at 15. So I, I fell in love with the physical form of those snakes. At first, I was wrapped over the array of colors present in just a few species, crimson bellies, copper backs, brown bodies, and black bands. Then I noticed the patterns, a single swath of pure color, thick stripes at regular intervals, like the shadows cast on the ground in front of a picket fence, or a complex patchwork of squared splotches connected by slender, jagged lines, making delicate diamonds outlined in black, extending from the snake's plain tan neck to the tip of its pointed tail. And then I watched how their bodies contracted in tension, released at rest, how minute movements propelled them down into the water or lively across its surface, how simple pulses pushed them forward along a thin branch and let them balance perfectly in the light. Sometimes I bring a notebook and write. In August, when I was 15, I overflowed with admiration and envy for these creatures, writing, Quote, as I watch them, I see the qualities they have that I wish for me, graceful and elegant with every contraction of their powerful muscles. They glide through the water with a superior air. They don't make a sound, but their presence is felt. Powerful and having the ability to bring human fear to the surface with one simple move to strike. They resemble well-respected royalty walking through a room with their heads held high and movements sculpted by grace. Yellow-bellied water snakes evoking ancient Greek statues. Their form is simple, lines fluid, but their facade is stoic. This simplicity is powerful. So there is me at 15. You can tell I was like pretty obsessed with the snakes already. And I really wasn't the only one inspired by these graceful lines of the snakes. There's works of art like we just saw from around the world that is bound with images of these snakes and they're redolent with symbolism and beauty. So my worldview expanded in those teenage years. I could see the elegant forms, I could see the connections to art and history, and those connections started to mean something. They meant more love, more care, and down the line, more conservation for these animals. But expanding our worldview requires effort. This is something we have to actively cultivate. We have to actively cultivate re reverence and recognition of beauty to help us move beyond fear and help others move beyond it. So I'm going to read you a little bit more about what happened at that nature center once when I was sitting there looking at the water snakes. So one day, a woman was entering the nature center. She was tall and big boned, but struggled to pull open that heavy wooden door. She stepped over the threshold. Her gaze rose over the low fossil line turtle enclosure, past the flighty kestrels, and landed on my beloved water snakes. She screamed, and then panically repeated, oh no, oh no, 
She backed out the door. The woman was so terrified of snakes that she refused to re-enter the building. I was perplexed by her reaction and felt rejected by the disgust she showed for the snakes I loved. Yet research suggests that this fear of snakes isn't uncommon. In fact, some studies suggest that fear of snakes and spiders is innate, hearkening back to our days in the trees as petite primates. Children as young as five months old have relatively have different reactions to images of snakes and spiders than to those of safe flowers. Fear of these animals elicit more severe phobias in a relatively large segment of the population. A full 5.5% of people have snake phobias. So the question is, what do we do? Research indicates that we can and should intervene, especially when children are young. Teaching children to respect animals, to care for them, not just snakes, facilitates more connection to and less fear of snakes over time. So we can model care and reverence for snakes when we do interact with them. So danger doesn't have to mean destruction and fear doesn't have to mean hatred. And I'll tell you a story, and this is paraphrasing the book, but in 1998, there was a 21 year old American and his father, and they took a trip to Peru. And what started out as a typical organized tour of the tributaries of the Amazon soon became a herping adventure that included a bona fide herpetologist from a Texas zoo. So the tour started, it started in the city of Nauta, which is a common launching point to explore the headwaters of the Amazon. So this is particularly uh, the Nahuatl Caño, the Nahuapa and Tigre rivers. And the town's dock, you can kind of imagine this, it's like this steep, muddy bank. It's got these 20 long, squared off logs secured in place by these thick wooden stakes. And boats of all kind are coming up to the dock. You know, ones with long thatched roofs, canoes filled with fish, but speedboats too. So the young man and the group of like 11 people are on this riverboat and tour finally launches. They're totally captivated, right? There's all these shoreline birds, groups of dozens of great egrets with those graceful white necks, a pair of jacanas. These are dark red birds with these red waddled foreheads, a horned screamer. It's like this crazy heavy bodied bird that has this echoing scream. The trip progresses, the boat stops at these isolated preserves, they're taking short hikes, the herpetologist is pointing out the guanas, they're stretched up on the branches, they find a little stump that's sheltering a pair of fringed leaf frogs that had laid eggs. Of course, snakes are super impressive too, there are snail eaters and tree boas, and all that herpetological splendor is like tucked in with these spiky yellow red birds of paradise plants and those broad leaves, thick green iodine plants. So I think you're getting the picture here. This totally cool trip, once in a lifetime. And so after the river cruise is over, you know, it's the last night of the trip and the young man and herpetologist decide to do some road cruising. So they drive about 15 miles outside of Iquitos and they're road cruising for snakes. And after finding a few dead on the road, they spot this three foot long snake that's kind of bordering the secondary growth forest. Snake's really pretty. It's patterned with these transverse bands of red, then black, then yellow, and then black and red again. It's about to slide off into the dense forest. So the young man, the herpetologist, they hop out of the car. The herpetologist thought from afar that it might be a lamprapeltis, you know, milk snake, king snake species. The young man is impulsive, doesn't want to let the snake get away. And so the snake begins to move. The man, the young man does too, reaches down and grabs it. it. Has the colorful snake in one hand. And the snake quickly turns and bites the fleshy part of his thumb four times in rapid succession. And the young man is smart enough to know that he's in trouble for two reasons. One, he saw the way that the snake forcefully chewed his hand. And second, it hurt, like instantaneously. There is definitely venom working its way into his body. So it turned out that maybe milk snake was actually a South American coral snake, Micrurus lemniscatus. And it's worth mentioning here that that old rule, red touches black fronted jack, red touches yellow dangerous fellow doesn't work. 
south of Mexico City. So in this case, Red touched Black, but it was no friend of Jack. And so the young man and the herpetologist now at this point are about 30 minutes from Iquitos. And that's a city of about 250,000 people in 1998. So it's filled with these zipping scooters and three wheel taxis. And at the time, Iquitos is pretty isolated. Um, it's the farthest inland, the Amazonian port, only accessible by river or air to the other major cities. So when they pulled up to the hospital, just kind of imagine it's uh, got the cement wall with chain link fence embedded in. And it allows you to see inside and you can see these small, like a small complex of whitewashed, hip roofed, one story buildings inside. And so they go inside this little hospital. It's got a dedicated staff relying on glass syringes. There are geckos poking their heads in and out of the windows, coming and going at will. The young man is in excruciating pain. There's a burning sensation working up his arm. He's admitted to the small, poorly equipped ICU. The pains reach his shoulder. The nurses are drawing blood, administering fluids. But honestly, the sequence of events get a little blurry here. The pain in his arms tremendous. The venom's breaking down his nerves. It's so painful that it's hard to focus. The nurse gives him opioids, but does nothing, absolutely nothing for the pain. They gave him a couple vials of antivenom, which is all they had available. But he was a bigger guy, you know, six feet, six feet and a half inch, something that half inch is really important. Nearly 200 pounds, like he boxed extracurricularly. He needed 20 vials, right? He got, he got two, he needed 20. So things go bad. Paralysis kicks in. He's got double vision because the muscles around his eyes are freezing. He's having trouble breathing, and this hospital doesn't have any ventilators. Uh, just a, like a side note here, his dad, his mom didn't go on this trip. His dad tells his mom that the plane's delayed. So she doesn't know what's happening during this, too. Um, so the man, the young man, he doesn't sleep for days. But when he finally did his dreams are like red hued they're filled with this sense of fear and evil slowly though after many nights the dreams became less terrifying he made friends with a gecko on the wall he began to eat mushy foods he actually began to recover super lucky and so you'd think that after an experience like that one might be you know wary of snakes turned off by them, not this guy. We met four years later, taking a tropical herpetology class. The man is now my husband and he never misses an opportunity to help a snake in need or any animal. He became a veterinarian. And so the point of this story is that fear doesn't have to mean hatred. It can stimulate curiosity, cultivate deep respect if we let it. So we can and should model that respect, but it's not always something that herpetologists have done well. So I'm gonna tell you another story. This one's a longer one that I'm gonna paraphrase here, but I think it gets to the heart of my message. The goal here is to illustrate three major themes. One is that snakes are fascinating, but we still only have a basic knowledge about them. Developing identities, whether these be our environmental or professional or personal identities is a complex process. And then also our emotional connections, the third point, our emotional connections to the creatures around us matter. So both for the natural world and for the people around us. Let me see if I can paraphrase this story. Essentially, when I was about 20 years old, that's me, I went to Nicaragua and took a tropical herpetology course. And that tropical herpetology course was led by a professor from a New York university and his like tough as nails TA who really rocked the, um, a, a woman there. And we were doing this boa constrictor tracking study, right? So, so the boa is there now, people, uh, We'll get into this a little bit, but boas have kind of shifted 
their taxonomy a little. At the time, we were calling these boa constrictors. Um, and we were implanting uh, a number, like these giant transmitters into their body cavities and then tracking the boa constrictors around with these radio transmitters. And so the research is, is pretty fascinating at the time because it's hard, it's hard to track snakes. And even still, we don't always understand where they're going, why they're going there, what they're doing. It, at the time was really exciting just to be able to like create a map to see their, their home ranges and figure out more about what the species is doing. And the research was interesting enough that it attracted the attention of a cable news program. And, you know, this is something you probably know the type of show that I'm talking about, right? Like a guy dressed up in uh, safari clothes, where he's alternately like talking in a stage whisper and then like getting really excited. And there's like a big venomous snake right in his face. And um, that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And so we go around with them for a few days. I'm in a couple episodes now, this TV show, you know, trying to chat boa constrictors. Turns out while we're there, like we actually can't get our hands on any of the boa constrictors. We can like find them. We know that they're like buried in these rocks on this beautiful island in the middle of Lake Nicaragua in this dry forest, but we can't actually find a boa constrictor. And so uh, a man, Rodolfo, who had worked to, to bring boa constrictors to this little academic village in the woods, um, was able to find a boa constrictor that was eating chickens out of, of someone's coop, essentially, out of their pen. And so he brought the boa to the academic village, essentially to film for the, for the film crew to film the sky. Right. And so we're in this circle, me and, and I don't know, maybe 10 other students. And a guy's got this boa constrictor. And she's huge, right? Um, I keep saying constrictor and the taxonomy has moved on, but it's just stuck there. Um, I think it's boa imperator now, northern boa. Anyway, we've got the boa and it's huge and the the tv star is talking about boas what they eat that they're constrictors like just given given some of the facts there but the snake's getting agitated and the guy keeps pulling her back by the tail and and she's surrounded right she's surrounded by this group of predators and so she begins to lash out and I remember the moment when her face hits the bottom of somebody's boot and it just made this like sickening thud and I had this moment of just pure disgust right like like this isn't the way that we should be treating these animals and I walked out of the circle you know I was pretty young I didn't kind of have that bravery yet to to say in front of everyone, like, this is crap, we shouldn't be doing this. Instead, I just left, right? It was like my silent protest. But it was a, a moment that stayed with me for a really long time. Um, I think that was the moment where I realized, you know, that there was a shadow side of herpetology. There was a, a side of herpetology that was kind of based on feats of daring based on something other than respect, based on ego. I was also starting to get a, a sense too of um of something that I'm gonna call the boys club of herpetology for lack of a better word. So I remember in this the same trip we're in Omatepe and I was kind of hanging out by myself one night, looking over over the lake. It's black lake. It's got like bull sharks under there and cichlids and all these cool things and I um have been kind of like I don't know not feeling like part of the group and just needed some alone time so I was sitting by by the water for a little while I had a, a bottle of dark 
it's like a bottle of Florida Kanye rum, right? And so I finally decided, oh, I, you know, I probably should go back. People are like, half the people are like in the, at the village, like putting radio transmitters on the boas and I should probably get that experience. And so I start walking back and I've got the rum in my hand and I look down and there's this beautiful snake in front of me. And it's a cat-eyed snake. And it's just doing what cat-eyed snakes do, right? It's like next to the water. It's a favorite habitat. Like it's got these beautiful kind of amber-colored eyes. And so I reach down one hand really fast and like grab the snake, pick it up, and then kind of like wrap its body around my arm. But I'm still holding on to the rum with the other hand. And I'm able to bring it back to the other students. It was a group of all guys. The girls were just like in the cabin doing something else and the guys were doing the, the surgeries. And so I bring it back and all of a sudden I'm like a superstar. You know, they're like, oh man, you caught this. And right, oh, it's really aggressive. And like someone takes a snake from me and they're like taking pictures. And I hadn't realized until that moment that I hadn't been in the in-group right? From that moment on, I became part of this group where if a snake was found or something was found, I, people found me too so that I could see it. And so the Boys Club of Herpetology that I'm talking about, it wasn't you know, like based actually on gender, right? It's just like lack of imagination and what we call this. It was, it was really based on feats of daring. I had gone, caught snakes before on that trip, but you know, it was like a speckled racer, you know, it's not, wasn't that exciting. And, you know, I was pretty slow. Um, and we kind of see this in the literature, right? So at this time, when I'm studying, probably 10% of all papers about snakes were published by women. Today, that figure is closer to 30% of papers published on snakes are about women. We've seen a ton of changes, right? Including from male colleagues in the field, they're trying to make herpetology more inclusive, trying to, um, I don't know, get away from the sense of exclusive sense of exclusivity. But these things are tied together, right? So I said that one of my points here is thinking about developing identities and how complicated it is and how something as simple as a little bit of roughness or disrespect for an animal can almost turn one away totally from, from a field of study, right? There's these points, they're like the turning points. So we've got to be really careful with our young people, right? And the literature suggests this is true too. I have some published papers on environmental identity development. So these things go together and they're important. And so I just want to bring us back for a second, right? Like, why do we care? about this. And so let's just remember snakes are disappearing. For snakes, the world can be a really scary place around the world. Researchers have been documenting their declines. We've got habitat destruction and fragmentation, mechanized agriculture, illegal harvesting, over harvesting, invasive species, they all threaten snakes. There are threats that we haven't researched very well. We don't really have an understanding how climate change is going to affect snake populations. It's probably not going to be good. How is the increase in mammalian measles predators like raccoons and domestic cats affecting snake populations? If we think about uh, what we do know in the published literature, a recent publication in Nature showed that habitat destruction, habitat change, and other factors in which we humans play a major role are the biggest threat for snakes. And when we're thinking about this, habitat loss due to agriculture in particular is a big deal. So in my own research, I found that snake abundance had declined in Illinois by at least 80% since the 18, late 1800s. Most of that loss was due to agriculture. 60% of snake species today are threatened by habitat destruction specifically from agriculture. And here's the place where we need to stop and pause. This is something we can do something about, right? Like livestock and the crops grown to feed them make up 80% of global agricultural land. If we eat less meat, we can save snakes too. Okay, then of course we've got urban development, road building, 
this is the next threat to snakes, and it already impacts about 30% of snake species. And speaking globally, right, like, like locally in the United States or where you live, agriculture might not be the threat, it might be the urbanization. Again, it's something we can do something about. We can develop conservation corridors, wildlife-friendly crossings across roads of all sizes, you know, we could grow our cities with nature in mind and mitigate those threats. And then we have to remind ourselves or remind others, right? Because I feel like I'm, I'm, we're all part of this together in this group, like people that are dedicated to herps. Um, we want to remind people why safe snakes, like they're a critical part of the food web. They reduce rodent populations that can impact crops and disease, but also they have deep cultural significance to people around the world. They help us, right? They're the sources of medical advances. Scientists are still discovering new species. Those new species have different um, model chemicals in, in their saliva and their venom that might be useful to us. So we don't actually want snakes to disappear. And we certainly don't want snakes to disappear before they've been discovered. They are useful, they're meaningful, they're deserving of respect, and they're absolutely fascinating. So what does this mean for us moving forward? I think what it means is that we need to remember that snakes are fascinating, and we still only have a very basic knowledge about them. It means that we need to do more research. We need to understand these creatures, how they interact with the environment, the roles they play, the ecosystem services they provide their taxonomic relationships, the chemicals they produce, their social relationships, and the cultural connections that exist with them. There's a lot of stuff that we still don't really understand about snakes. We also really need to get curious. You can travel either in reality or through books and literature to understand how different people interact with and view snakes. We can also get curious about people. Why do different cultures view snakes differently? What do those differences mean in terms of actual interactions with snakes, in terms of the treatment of the natural world, in terms of respect for each other? And we can begin to interrogate what those cultural associations with snakes reveal about our own values. So I think as we're starting to wrap up here, we can kind of explore this a little bit. Right, explore some cultural beliefs, associations with snakes, some options for us. So I want to take us to a Garden of Eden, but this is not a biblical Garden of Eden. Instead, we're going to look at a different type of Garden of Eden, which is a biodiversity hotspot. When we look at the hotspots for the more than 3,400 snakes around the world, few places stand out. Uh, parts of Southeast Asia, Spots in Southern Africa and the Amazon, forests in Central America. But we can't leave out Australia. Nearly the whole continent of Australia has been identified as a biodiversity hotspot for snakes. And like most Edens, Australia is under threat, right? Its population is increasing by nearly half a million people a year. Roads are being built and they're contributing to snake mortality. Um, you know, this, uh, if you've ever been to Australia, in the central part, they've got these huge road trains, these high-speed semi-trucks. They're hauling three or four trailers. They're stretching 175 feet long. They're cruising at 100 kilometers an hour. The massive trucks, the, the feeding tubes of rural Australia, they're also killer for snakes. So Australia, it's got about 172 snake species. It's got a couple major strengths when it comes to snake conservation, in my opinion. First is Richard Shine, right? They have their very own snake champion who's written a masterpiece of a natural history book on Australian snakes, published articles shedding light on threats to snake persistence, like commercial exploitation of snakes for skins, these bounties, roundups, pesticides, and chemical contaminations. And I love this. I think many of you are going to relate to this. Richard Shine once said that being interested in snakes is like supporting a football team that loses almost every game. You're part of a small but enthusiastic minority while everyone else thinks you're crazy. And he also goes on to say, you've got two options. You can either abandon the unpopular cause 
or try to persuade everyone else to re-examine their attitudes. I find that really inspiring. Shine clearly chose the latter. I think in Australia, another thing they've got going for them is a sense of humor and a sense of caring. There's this news story published on, by a number of Australian news outlets about an amethystine python, which is pictured here. It's Australia's longest snake species. And it had eaten a little girl's fluffy white and blue stuffed cow. It was like a stuffed animal toy. And the snake um, had surgery. Stuffy, was free, snake was too. And what I really loved about this was two things. One, there's a lot of fun in the story. You've got like these crazy quotes, like here's just a taste of what Australia's longest danger noodle gets up to and toy too much to swallow. It just it kind of cracks me up. But what I also love was the empathy. So the family that saw the snake outside their house eating the little their little girl's toy, they were worried. And they were worried about the snake. They kept an eye on it for a little bit, trying to make sure it was okay. And they decided to get it help. And it got surgery. And they made sure it was released after surgery. That toy, it went to, you know, like toy cow heaven. But the snake, it went back into the wild. Well, the last thing I want to share about Australia is that they do have some tougher laws. In the Northern Territories, killing a snake can cost someone over $75,000. You can face jail time up to five years. Does this mean that people in Australia don't kill snakes? No, they still do. But it's a start. And you pair that with education, compassion, and curiosity, and it can lead to some pretty powerful outcomes. We know that fear has not stopped other cultures from revering snakes, um, associating snakes with healing and wisdom and creation itself. Uh, the Hopi, an indigenous tribe, and, and your closer, your neck of the woods, uh, has a long history of reverence for snakes. And uh, historically, and, and possibly this tradition continues, I am, I am not an indigenous person. And and for that reason, I'm not allowed to see these ceremonies, but there is a snake ceremony that's meant to encourage rainfall and the maturity of traditional crops, corn, squash, and beans. And in preparation for this final snake dance, snakes are collected, right? And they're like collected over the course of four mornings from the four directions. Um, they're purified by a snake priest that's using specially prepared water. Songs are sung to the snakes until Orion rises in the east. And the ceremony culminates with the Day of Snakes, where up to 100 snakes, including rail snakes, are corralled by cottonwood limbs, and dancing can begin. And one person historically, if you look at footage of videos from this from the 1890s or early 1900s, you can actually see people um, carrying a snake. There's a snake dancer gently it looks holding a snake between their teeth and there's black and white footage showing people in traditional regalia and they're going in this circle and there's an archway in in the circle and it makes it look like an infinity of people moving as someone disappears new people are are coming out and so there's a a sacred beat there right you can't hear it in the film, it's a silent film, but you can see it. After the dancing's finished, the snakes are released to the four directions. They're carrying prayers, prayers for rain and plenty. They're messengers to the spirits. And so one of the things to think about is how much culture makes a difference. So in 1913, President Theodore Roosevelt observed the snake dance and noted, uh, quote, that many of the tourists did not show the proper respect, unquote, for the ceremony. Hopi elders shared those sentiments, and today the ceremony of gratitude and good fortune is closed off largely to non-Indigenous visitors. We can look elsewhere. And so Martin Nielsen was this early 20th century scholar of ancient Greek and Roman religions, and he described the importance of snakes in domestic worship and ancient Greece. And the 
kind of end story here is that snakes symbolize Zeus and they also symbolize a house god. And so snakes that were in people's houses were given offerings of water, oil, and fruit, uh, fruit usually in amphorae. Um, people would tend to the snakes, like try to give them good care and feeding. And Nelson also wrote that in the Balkans in Greece in the early 20th century, snakes found in one's home were still welcomed as guardian spirits. They were greeted as grand ladies might be. And in 1940, Nielsen recorded that veneration of the house snakes still occurred in other places in Europe. He described a man he knew personally in his home country, he was Swedish, who offered milk to living house snakes. And so one of the things I like to think of is like, you know, what sort of person do I want to count myself as? I think I count myself among these people, right? I think many of you might too, like those people that revere snakes for their mystery and their history. Those who have a soft spot for the underdog can find beauty in unexpected places. And for me, inculcation into the cult of Ophidians, you know, another word for snakes there, derived from Greek, Ophis, is pretty simple, right? A few walks of discovery with a comfortable guide, an acre of old field that yielded some hidden delights. And perhaps developing respect and appreciation for snakes could be that simple for everyone if we gave them the opportunity. So that brings us back to us, right? We can all do our part, especially this group of people here. Our emotional connections to the creatures around us matter, and we have the power to teach the next generation. We can emphasize wisdom. We can emphasize precautionary principles and conservation and respect. And respect not just for snakes, but for all creatures, including other people too. And that's that's what I got for you tonight. Wow, thank you so much. What a what a great, great presentation. And just I could really feel a, a real truly heartfelt sense of admiration and passion about these animals and you're as you know you're in good company and but I also I do I appreciate hearing that that sort of admiration come out you know we're really uh, accustomed to hearing things in a, in a really sort of a scientific manner and you know that is you know of course very you know important and educational and and but you know I think we can sort of gloss over the sort of emotional and um, personal aspect, you know, of our interests and passions. And, and it's really nice to hear somebody, um, like yourself, you know, speak in that way. And I was really, really touched. I'm gonna have like so many questions and I'll welcome anybody to jump in with questions and throw them up in the chat. But I was really touched by your, your, your writing as a 15 year old. It was incredible. Um, I wish, you know, today I could write uh, so so lovely about you know these these animals you really have a had a gift at a young age and um, how thoughtful were you to have taken the time to write that as a child I I I wouldn't have had that those thoughts I don't think but it must be so nice to like be able to look back on that um, so thanks so much for sharing that I think a lot of folks would be really nervous to share something they wrote in their teenage years <laughs> uh, to a large group. Um, but uh, I found that really beautiful. So um, let me check the chat, you know, um, throw uh, messages or uh, any questions up in the chat. I know I saw one earlier, let's see from Eli. I think he was uh, referencing an image that looked like maybe it was a, um, a drift fence in a field or at the edge of a, agricultural field yeah so that that was a picture of my research in Illinois I had uh 21 sites set out over the Grand Prairie region so this is like kind of the the top part of the state doing a multi-scale habitat study to look at species diversity at 
thinking about three scales, microhabitat, the larger landscape scale, looking at fragmentation and such, and then regional scale variables like precipitation uh, differences. A handmade, I don't know if you could see any of the traps in there, the, the wood boxes, mm. handmade that in my garage, my family. Very cool. Okay, yeah, I think uh, you got, we, we got, we got some keen observers out there that are wondering, <laughs> about, wondering about your methods. Um, well, I, I know I had some, um, you know, I was thinking about your comments about the boys club and the sort of sensational aspect of um, interacting with, you know, especially snakes, but, you know, animals generally for, um, you know, in the past, what would have been nature documentaries and today is for social media and, you know, various things of that nature. Um, and, you know, I'll probably be a little guilty of, of some of those things in my younger years. And, mm -hmm. and I look back and I see those, you know, photos and I think, oh, that was kind of silly. And, and, um, and I, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's really fair to be sensitive to the, you know, sort of well being of the animal in that circumstance. I'm not sure that those sorts of performances are really, you know, I don't know that they're educational. I'm not sure that they put the animal in a, in a light that can sort of garner um, empathy for, to a lot of people. It sort of seems to focus, in my opinion, on um, the sensational danger aspect of the animal and less so it's, you know, interesting natural history or its beauty. Um, and I think, you know, the nature documentaries of the past were, you know, pretty guilty of that. And I think that there's a sort of through line into, um, um, you know, today's culture of uh, um, sort of herp explorers and, and uh, personalities of various types. And, and I, I think um, sort of calling that out is, is really warranted and, um, you know, something I think we can all evolve to become a little bit better at and maybe discover that, you know, observing, you know, some patience and, you know, observation of the animal's natural behaviors is really a, lo a whole lot more interesting, um, you know, but it, it's, it's hard with the, the patience part, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And as I, I know in my own family, we've evolved over time you know it used to be every snake that we saw we had to grab it and now now we don't you know we can sit there and and watch it and then you see some interesting things I started to see that the rat snake that lives by our house like follows the same route right like time after time looking for food and probably like I don't know every three days we'll come back and then check the same little places for, for food. And if we had kept, if we grabbed that snake, maybe we'll have come back and we never would have been able to observe that behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you, you, you never really know what you miss when the first thing that you do is grab it. Um, you might've been lucky enough not to, not, not to even cause the snake to um, change its whatever, behavior it was in in the first place. Um, well, anybody jump in with a question if you have one. Um, I sure. want to add too is um, that the message here of, of using emotion to uh, create intellectual connections and foster learning and connection. There, there is some good data now to support using these techniques and it's really part of how how we learn that emotions are a key part of learning. I see hand up there. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I want to first of all, um, good insight, Max, and um, <laughs> uh, about you know how can we really best respect and revere these animals, um, and and have cultural practices around them that are truly respectful, not just kind of, um, you know, giving mixed messages that way. So I appreciate your insight on that, Max. And so um, to Nikki, though, I, I love all those like uh, cultural and historical references and those little stories about how other cultures 
um, you know, appreciate or, um, you know, celebrate snakes. And I, uh, I think that's a rabbit hole. I could go down easily with <laughs> lizards as well. <laughs> and, um, something else that, um, I appreciate that you brought up, um, Max, can you switch the camera to back on her? Or am I missing something? Oh, there we go. Okay. Anyways, um, something else I really appreciate you bringing up, though, is the impact of animal agriculture. That's really clearly the elephant in the conservation room. And we like to talk about fossil fuels, but nobody likes to talk about the impacts of animal agriculture and other anthropogenic influences. But um, but really, it's it's so clearly such a problem that nobody wants to tackle, and it takes individual and personal responsibility to uh, reverse the problems, uh, the current problems around this world of animal agriculture and its impact on biodiversities, on the sixth mass extinction. Um, how much water we're using, how many crops we're raising just to feed the livestock. So just so many problems with animal agriculture. And I really appreciate you, um, you know, not shying away from mentioning that. I'm currently taking a climate change course and it hasn't even been brought up yet. And I'm like, want to kind of, you know, beat my head against the computer every time they talk about fossil fuels without mentioning animal agriculture. So anyway, I want to just thank you um, for bringing that up. And I hope that more people can start talking about it because animal agriculture is our number one biggest environmental impact, environmentally impactful activity. It's the biggest threat to animal conservation, herps or otherwise. And so, you know, I, I hope that more people will start bringing it up and talking about it because we, we won't get anywhere just talking about driving electric cars if we're not tackling the impact of everybody eating bacon cheeseburgers. <laughs> so thank you so much for bringing that up. And um, I, I would be interested, seriously, I would be interested in hearing some, um, kind of cultural references and ceremonies around lizards, if you know of any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate your feedback and your comments. Um, I think right now I'm going to stick to the snakes, but maybe we can come back another time and, and chat more about lizards. I'm seeing a, another question there in the chat box too. Yes, let's, let's about, see here. If I have a favorite strategy for bringing open-minded people, adults or children with a predisposed but perhaps unfounded fear of snakes around to greater appreciation or at least less fear. And so, you know, I, I'm a big fan of using what you have around you. And around here, we have a lot of teeny tiny snakes, right? We've got green snakes, we've got worm snakes, we've got earth snakes, uh, steraria, decay, like we just have little little snakes that we can introduce people to. And that's, that's what I start with. I think that a small snake is a lot less intimidating. Um, you know, even if that small snake bites, person that you're introducing the snake to is not even going to feel it or notice it. So it's not really going to reinforce the fear. And those snakes that I just mentioned tend to be super docile. And so I think that's, that's one way. Another way is personal storytelling, where I tell positive stories about snakes or times I've encountered them or I've seen them do something neat. Um, that is, is probably the strategy that I use most. One, storytelling. We know from a lot of literature, storytelling is um, one of the most important ways that 
there are techniques that we have for educating people and connecting them emotionally. And then being really mindful of how you introduce somebody to a to a snake, right? And those little snakes tend to be great. Great, thanks for those uh, great questions. I see a couple more, let's see from Jessica. Um, we have a comment it says, uh, honestly, could it be an evolutionary reaction? I love snakes and run towards them, but if I'm mechanically walking, I almost uh, jump uh, on a, and and almost step on a stick that looks like a snake shaped <laughs> uh, jump out of my skin. Yeah, I can. I think. Um, so there, there is. That. It's controversial, and there's not um, scientific consensus. But there is some evidence that suggests that we have, at, at some level or some some proportion of the population, has an innate fear of snake that snakes. And the idea is that once we were teeny, you know, like evolutionarily, we're descended from monkeys and monkeys would have been really vulnerable to snakes. And uh, some of the other studies that, that support this is that also people tend to freak out with birds, right? You can look at a bird from far away and you're like, oh, that's really nice, right? But then the bird comes close and you really are just like quite scared. Um, and people will have, some people will have bird phobias kind of the same way that they have snake phobias. And so one of the things to note is that um, evolutionarily, when you have these teeny tiny monkeys, they actually were also really vulnerable to birds. Uh, we don't think about it that much, but big birds aren't, aren't so nice to tiny primates. And so, so Jessica, I can, I can see where you're coming from there. And and like, I'm not going to be ashamed to admit it. I mean, you know, I have a book on snakes, but if a snake crosses my path and I wasn't expecting it, I too sometimes still have a startle response. Great questions. Thank you. Oh, I see another um, uh, question here from, let's see, Cameron asks, um, says uh, he has an LLC where people can rent him out and uh, bring his own pet snake to events for educational presentations. Um, he wonders if he has any recommendations on what more can be uh, when it comes to helping people understand that they don't need to be afraid of snakes instead of, uh, instead just respect them. Uh, I first of all, like I really applaud the work that you're doing. Thank you for doing that because it, it benefits all of snake kind and I think humankind too. Right? If we can develop empathy for snakes, we can also probably show each other more empathy. I think that um, my recommendations for this work, you know, sometimes it's just preparing people. Sometimes saying, you know, telling people like, you might be afraid of snakes, but but guess what, right? You can grow to be comfortable with them or ask them what it is that they're, they're afraid of. Are they afraid of being bitten? Are they worried that it's just going to feel slimy? So many people think snakes are slimy, right? They're, they're not. So um, talking, like, I think, I suspect that what it is that you're doing is the way forward, right? It, it feels slow, it's not always effective, but the the more people are, are exposed, the more they see modeling of respect for snakes, um, the more inclined they will be to to try try to touch my, you know, I teach classes here at Duke University, wildlife service classes. It took me a semester and a half to get one of my students to to finally touch a snake. And I never pressured her, right? It's always optional, um, but it was just a fantastic day. You know, after doing it week after week, amazing day, the day that she decided she wanted to, to hold this little ring neck snake. That is an encouraging story, yeah. I, I like, I personally, I like to use terms like cute and beautiful. Um, when talking about snakes to, you know, maybe folks who are um, experiencing them up close for the first time. Um, I don't know, I just find it, it's a little bit disarming. It's the same words that they used to describe their dog or 
um, things like that. Um, let's see if we got. Oh, snake phobia. Uh, oh, yes. So the word for snake phobia that we use is ophidophobia, and it comes from that opus, ophidian, modern Greek. They use the word phidi for, for snake. So our term for snake phobia comes from Greek, and it's ophidophobia. Yeah, the best. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of nice times. Well, I'm. I have a few more, and please, folks, if they're um, ju just jump in with the questions. Interrupt me. You know, you know, I'll just ramble on if you don't. But I, I was, um, I was really blown away the story about the the Greek sort of connection, and maybe it sounds like uh, people from various parts of the um, Caucasus region. And um, anyway, anyhow, they're sort of um, really, truly respecting the the small snakes that live in and around their homes. And I that's that's a completely new um, bit of snake information to me. I would have never have guessed. I guess I just always assumed that forever, you know, with some exceptions, people had uh, fear, you know, uh, fear, or you would know, kill snakes around the home, but. That's actually a sort of a really encouraging thing to know, I, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah one then, of the things I'm interested in um, is exploring a little bit more about um, European cultures and other associations, particularly pre pre Christian or non Christian associations with snakes. So thinking about okay, ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans. Um, I have a lot of Polish ancestry, so thinking about you know, how to have, have Poles and people in, in the more Slavic regions, Eastern Europe, interact with snakes, you know, hundreds of years ago. We might uh, provide different models. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. I figured they, they already... They already figured out how to do it, maybe in a, in a way, uh, learning from the past, you know. Um, you also mentioned that you had uh, maybe published a paper or two on, um, I think the term you used was uh, environmental identification uh, development. Is that, was that right? Or, uh, yeah, environmental identity development. Identity, yeah. identity. Thank you. Yeah, that's the key word there. Um, what a cool concept. And, you know, probably, again, another one I've been uh you know maybe blind blind to or neglectful and um but i think such an important one just knowing that there are um you know parts of our communities that are just sort of left out of these conversations and introductions to um the natural world and and i think we all know that the more you know the more you, you appreciate and the more you appreciate the more you want to protect and save and it sounds like such an important um, uh, field to, you know, study and learn more about. Um, yeah. One of the most important findings from, from that research and environmental identity research in general is that having mentors seems to be one of the most important ways that people begin to develop that kind of environmental ethos. Yeah, great, great point. I think we can all can sort you of- that again? Can you repeat that last thing you said? Yeah, having a mentor. So, you know, for us in, in this room right now, if we were mentors, that would maybe one of the ways that we could have the biggest impact on the next generation to mentor the next generation to mentor children. Um, that is the number one thing that emerges from literature as having the biggest impact on environmental identity development. I think that's such a, you know, such a great point. I see a comment from Jessica says her uh, sixth grade teacher had a pet corn snake in the classroom. And when we wrote, um, and we wrote our, when I'm 30, I will be, uh, in quotation marks, um, about half the class said they would have a pet snake. 
Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's really, that's no surprise, is it? Yeah. Um, I think, I think we, we can all understand that the kids are just so interested and fascinated in, in wildlife and animals, um, uh, that it's easy for them to love and appreciate them. And the, you know, whatever fears or misconceptions are usually sort of something that was, um, taught to them. I, uh, it looks like Nina has her hand, hand up. Do you have another question there? Yeah, I do. Um, so you mentioned um, movement earlier. Anyway, something you said made me think about this is can you um, relay, uh, pun intended, um, any of the like most recent research on some of the physiology behind snake movement? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think what we're learning about the, the actual physiology of snake movements is that there are more types of movement than we originally thought, right? There's kind of like this side winding, there's this like scrunching caterpillar movements, there's like this movement here. And then there are, there are two or three other types of movements that we're learning about. Um, other behaviors that we're still learning about are like digging behaviors. So not very many snake species are actually capable of, of digging. Um, we've had some evidence for a long time, like uh, the tuifus, they're like the bull snake sorts of species are able to actually do some, some digging with their bodies. And there have been some recordings. That literature is pretty old, but I think there's some newer literature coming out that, that maybe not only the tuifus are um, capable of of burrowing, which to me is really interesting. I think that probably is is a limit of what I know of recent literature about snake movement right now. Can I ask you, do you, do you live, I assume you live in, in Ohio? Oh, me? Yes, yeah. No, I, well, I live in North Carolina now. Oh, North Carolina, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I grew up oh, in what? Illinois. Oh, Illinois, excuse me. Yeah, but oh, North Carolina. Either way, like a, my knowledge of like the snake species I'm mentioning or the accents, which I haven't lost. Well, North Carolina sounds like a nice place for a, a herpetology nerd to. It is, but get you know what's door. fascinating to me is that North Carolina and Illinois have the same number of snake species. So wow. you, they both have about thirty-seven, which blows my mind because you never. You just want to expect it. Mm. Anyway. Wow. Okay. That's okay. That sort of uh, goes at some misconceptions on my part. Yeah. Uh, our uh, our, uh, our uh, social media director, Josh Ams, presented last month on his uh, previous year's trip to Snake Road. So we got to see some, you're probably familiar, I'm assuming. Um, we got to see some wonderful images from Southern Illinois, and I was really blown away by just I had I hadn't ever had a chance to visit there. Just what a beautiful location and what incredible diversity and um, a unique, you know, place in uh, you know uh, that state. Anyhow, um, well, if let's see, I'm gonna check the chat one more time. But if there, we got you got for what it's worth, you got a lot of great uh, comments and people saying thank you. And I just want to reiterate all of that. Um, Again, it really means a lot to us to have you come and take some time with us. I know it's really asking uh, a lot, so we really, really do appreciate it. Um, know that you have uh, allies and friends in New Mexico, and um, is there, uh, can we, uh, is there a social media account or anything you would like uh, recommend that we look for or, or a way that we can follow you, or is there any way oh, yeah. I can Get well, your paper on environmental identification. I would love to read that. Yeah, so feel free to follow me at um, on Instagram at NC Naturalist One. I also have a website, which is sites that sites that what is it? Sites of Nicholas that took that you, and then just my name and. Oh, there it is. Thank there you. And find out a lot of, about me and get links to some of those papers that I mentioned. 
And also, if I'm ever in New Mexico, I am going to be sure, like, be expecting some emails because I would love to to go out and go herping with y'all. So, no, oh, that would be great fun. Yeah, we would sure love to do that. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, yeah, make a, yeah, give us an email, uh, send us an email. Um, we're, you know, of course, I'm sure, like, I'm not sure exactly the um, climate in parts of North Carolina, perhaps you have a little bit longer warm season than we do, but we had our first sort of frosty nights recently and it's um, sort of the end of our snaky season, but uh, we'll all be scheming for next year, I'm sure all winter long. Um, Sounds good. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming with us. Um, thank you. Again, we really do appreciate it. It's lovely meeting you. I hope we get to talk again soon. Um, and I will welcome everybody to hang out as we um, move towards our business for, uh, portion of the meeting. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you all for having me. Really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. All righty. Good night.